here. What's the significance? What's going on? So you've been walking now for 2,300 feet, Ishai, and this is the first turn in the entire path. When we crawled, and we all of a sudden saw the arched roof over our heads, we understood that we had entered some type of area of prominence. We weren't exactly sure why. And then the tunnel curves, and as we followed it, one of the guys with us said, I bet if it didn't turn, it would continue going straight underneath the area of the western wall of the Temple Mount. That's why Herod built it as it turns around to prevent that from happening. And in fact, we are at the southwestern corner of the Temple Mount right now. We're walking around the southwestern corner, heading north towards the western wall. Mm -hmm. Okay. Once you're in the area of the Temple Mount, everything changes. The walls are wider. The roof is arched and bigger. This was an area that was mu uh, used on a much greater level because this is where the holy, all the holy worshiping was taking place. But this was still the water channel? Still the water channel. Okay. But people would have been down here more. For whatever yeah. reason, we found many caves here, areas for people to work. Apparently this area was much more accessible than the rest. Okay. Take a look. You crawled all these feet, 2,300 feet, until you got to this room. This room has some kind of chimney, some kind of skylight, and here you were able to turn around. Where are we at? I, it's hard for me to describe to you what it's like slithering on your stomach for two and a half hours with four other people, having no idea where you're going to go or what you're going to find, until we reach this room. We fell into this room, and one of the guys with us said, wow. There's light coming in from up above. It was Eli Shukran from the Israel Antiquities Authority. We were accompanying him. We said, where are we? He said, we must be somewhere in the old city. Until then, he said, everybody be quiet. It was about 8.39 in the morning, and we heard a guide speaking in English to a group 25, 30 feet over our heads, saying to the group, here we are, standing underneath Robinson's Arch, the original entranceway into the temple. And we realized that we are deep underneath the ground, underneath Robinson's Arch. Where are we now? We are in a room which is a cistern which predates this tunnel. This cistern is from the first temple period. During the time of Shlomo's temple, people were using this shaft, this chimney as you called it, to drop buckets and draw water. When Herod made his tunnel on his road, he simply broke one wall in here, the other wall behind us, and simply broke right through to make his, to make his water channel. But here we are, we are underneath right now the largest freestanding bridge in the world which led the Jewish people and people from all over the world into the temple. So the western wall is right here? Yeah, just, just beyond us. Wow. You're going to go underneath it right now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm seeing something a little bit irregular here. There's a gigantic stone that has somehow, seems like it's fallen into the tunnel, and yet kind of built around it is the mason work around the... Uh, uh, this gigantic stone, God, that must weigh, what, 30, 40 tons? What does it weigh? Five tons, but, <laughs> but it's still a lot. It's about five, about five cars, just one of these stones. In fact, we understand that this stone fell during the construction of the temple. This must have fallen. The work crews dropped a stone. It got wedged here in the tunnel, and they simply built over it and around it. Now, when we came through here, Yishai, you have to understand, Eli Shukran, the archaeologist, said, wait a second, I've seen that stone before. I said, where? He said, Charles Warren, who was sent here by Queen Victoria in the 1860s to look for treasure, there's a drawing that they made of him at the time underneath the stone. We crawled out. We went online. We found the actual picture, the drawing of Charles Warren, the great archaeologist of, of ancient Israel, standing underneath this stone. This picture is 1867. There's Charles Warren underneath the stone. And here we are, continuing the journey looking for treasure. So he was lost? This, this, he was lost. This, Sure, we had the picture, but we didn't know where Charles Warren ever was. He climbed out, left. The Muslims covered up all the holes, and nobody ever came down here again. Wow, 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 wow. So knowledge is oftentimes lost and refound again, and that's the story of, of uh, archaeology. Hopefully this time we won't lose it again, right? That's the hope. It's here to stay. Daron, when people show up at the Western Wall, they're always amazed at the spiritual site, and people from all over the world are showing up. Um, they're also very surprised when I tell them that what they're seeing is actually just a small part of the Western Wall. The Western Wall is much larger. What I'm 
always excited to tell them uh, is that right beneath what they're looking at the Kotel, if they're facing the Western Wall, they look to the right, they'll see the Southern excavations, and they'll also see the continuation of the Western Wall, which was actually a shopping plaza, which proves that it was Jewish. So, so therefore, you know, people get very excited. They see it was real life, you know, storefronts and all the stuff. And, and I explained to them that the Western Wall actually goes far into, th through the old city, all the way through the Arab quarter, the Muslim quarter. And we talk about also the, uh, the Western Wall tunnel ex excavations. And it goes way down. Actually, if you go to the Western Wall today, you go into, into the tunnel, you can look down, you see it's way, way deeper down. But now you're telling me that it's yet even deeper down. And here we are at the Western Wall, at the foundations of the Western Wall right here. This is the foundation, this is where Herod started building uh, the temple and, 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 and its environs. So how come the people don't know about this? What does this mean? And what are these beautiful, beautiful stones rougher than we're used to seeing at the Kotel? Give me a little bit of an explanation, please. As you mentioned, Yishai, this was the largest structure on Earth, at least in the eastern half of the Earth, if not on the entire planet, at the time that was being used by people. Herod's temple was 12 square football fields in size. He plants the floor stones on the bedrock of Mount Moria. Here we are, dozens of feet beneath where worshipers are praying in a quiet underground plaza, which has been covered for 2,000 years. Herod first laid these stones, and then rethinking his plan, he covers these stones up in order to make a road higher than where we're standing today. The fascinating thing, Yishai, is when he goes to cover these stones to create a higher road, he sweeps the dirt from the Temple Mount into this area. Wow. Everything you find here is swept from the Temple Mount, and that is why the discoveries here have been absolutely unbelievable. Even from First Temple things? Yes, you found First Temple things, including seals from the First Temple with names on them, which we recently announced, the seal of Metanya, who appears in the Book of Chronicles. And that's just the beginning. Mostly what you find, though, are things at the time that the Temple was being used in its glory, like the golden bell that we find the first golden bell ever found in Israel, solid gold with a clasp on the end of it. And when we put, took it out and I shook it, it still has the pommel and the bell inside of it. Now, this was part of the high priestly garment. Uh, there would be a bell and a uh, pomegranate on the edge of the hem of his uh, tunic. And he would wear this and it would make a little bit of rustling noise as he walked into the Holy of Holies. He had to wear that in order to kind of announce himself. And we found those little gold bells. For the first time ever in the whole country, you find a golden bell, and you find it just next to the Temple Mount. The likelihood that this came from his garment, like you said, is incredibly high, according to all archaeological opinions. But that was just one thing we found. The next thing we found, Yishai, was this, perhaps the most moving piece, an inscription of the menorah. It only has five branches. Possibly the artist ran out of room. But somebody began in a very rough, almost like a childish way, to carve the shape of the menorah at the time when the Jewish menorah stood at the temple in the highlight of the service. They must have carved it, put their little carving off to the side. Herod sweeps it into this tunnel. It's one of only three depictions ever found of the menorah. We even have the stand that was found here. But of course, Shisha emits the glory. We also have, as you mentioned before, the destruction. This sword found in its scabbard is a sword from the Roman 10th Legion. We have to imagine, today you say the word Nazi and Jews get shivers up their spine. For 2,000 years, you said the word Roman 10th Legion and you got shivers up your spine. These were the people that killed a million of our people, that exiled us to the four corners of the earth. We find one of their swords inside its scabbard right here. Wow. So 10th Legion, these were serious, uh, these were serious fighting folks and they came to, to destroy Jerusalem. But before Jerusalem was destroyed, it was first rebuilt in this glorious fashion. And what Herod did was he took the small, let's call it Solomon's temple area, and he widened, in that, widened it out by making these uh, walls, that, including the Western Wall, uh, that gave a lot more room. He filled in the room that was left with dirt, created it, and made a much bigger plaza. You're talking about 12 football fields. And this is the very base of it. This is the very base of it. So if you want to kind of get to the root of, of the temple, the root of the Kotel, the Western Wall, here it is, this stone right here. How much does this weigh, you think? Come on. You know, dozens and dozens of tons. By the way, Yishai, there's still room here for a few notes. You can be amongst the first. I think I will pray here a little bit. Thanks, Daron. Thanks for the opportunity. Well, I'm looking forward to, you know, if you keep doing your... 
if you keep doing your work, maybe we'll we'll get even closer to praying, praying where where we once prayed in the ancient times, and one day we'll again. Can you hear that song? Amen. You've got something something in your hands for me, something uh, for our, uh, viewing pleasure here. You have a coin that has uh, somebody who looks a lot like my dad. Who who is this person on the coin? What does it say? I don't think you would want this person to be your dad. This says in it Vespasian. Vespasian is, of course, the Roman emperor that destroys the temple. This was called the Judea Capta coin because on the obverse side, it has a picture of a palm tree with a Jewish maiden crying as she submits to a Roman soldier whose shield and armor are sitting on the other side of the tree. This was, Yeshai, if the Jewish people had a cry to be free people, we didn't want to conquer anybody. We just want to live free, to daven to Hashem, to pray to God. This is what the Romans stood against, that everybody should be subjugated. The average victory coin minted by Rome would be minted maybe two or three times. This coin, Yishai, was minted 42 times. The Roman victory over the Jews was a victory over monotheism, over the freedom of an individual to communicate with God. The only arch to remain, the victory arch in Rome today, is the Arch of Titus, the victory over our people. Well, there's another side to, to the victory of the Romans over the Jews and the fact that they printed these coins. It shows what an intense enemy the Jews were. We were no pushover nation. We were actually the nation that fought them, annoyed them to no end. We actually rebelled against the Romans twice. And that just goes to show you the, the prowess, the fierceness uh, of the Jewish fighters. And, and in fact, Bar Kokhba took this coin and minted over it and said, yeah, for the freedom of Jerusalem, for the freedom of Zion. So we were a tough enemy. And a lot of times when people accuse Israel of being an occupier, I tell them, not only are we not an occupier, but we're occupation busters. We bust people who try to take over our land and stop us from worshiping the way we want to worship. We fought the Romans because we had the audacity. We lost, but here we are now, and we've won because we're back, and they're not. Right. Yishai, here we are. We're walking 25 feet up all the way to ground level to the street that our mothers and fathers thousands of years ago used to go into the temple. Daylight, wow. Woo! Oh my gosh. Oh my god. Oh my gosh, this was the most exciting staircase I've ever climbed in my life. We're at, we're at the continuation of the Western Wall. It's, it is breathtaking. I can't believe it. I just came out from underground. I just I just walked the way of my forefathers. Doron Spielman, you're the senior director of the City of David. Right behind us, we climbed out of a tunnel that connected the city of David to the Western Wall. And behind us here is a mound of stones, beautiful, huge, many ton stones. They were thrown down by the Romans as they were destroying the Second Temple. But they did not stop at the physical destruction of the Second Temple. The next step was Hadrian's brilliant effort to undermine Jewish history by changing the name of Jerusalem to Aeola Capitolina and the name of Israel to Syria Palestina. He basically renamed Israel Palestine. And one of the main fights that we have today is not only the physical fight of the right for the Jewish of the Jewish people to live in the land of Israel, we're constantly being terrorized and warred against. There's also a media or information war where the very history of the Jewish people is being challenged over and over again. Ahmadinejad, his main claim is we're not from here. You're not from the Middle East. You're a European problem. You weren't from here. You're not from uh, this whole region. He undercuts Abraham's uh, Middle Eastern nature, the fact that he was first from Iraq and then to Turkey and then to the Holy Land, then to Egypt, then back to the Holy Land. He undercuts Persian history, which shows that Judaism was there 1,500 years before Islam. But he constantly makes an effort to point out that we have no history in Jerusalem. The great historian Arafat also uncovered a lot of these uh, uh, truths that we actually never ever lived here. And yet all your work, and the City of David's work, and all the archaeologists who are doing great work, uh, the Antiquities Authority uncovering our history, are proving otherwise. What do you say to all those that claim that we have no history and therefore no rights in this land? You know, Yishai, I would separate into two. 
into three. There are people who know the truth of their history. There are people who will deny all truth at all expense, radical jihadists, Islamic radicals, which you can show them proof in front of their eyes, and because of this new effort to rewrite history, they'll deny it. Neither of those two camps are the ones we need to really be concerned with. What we need to be concerned with, Ishai, is the average man and woman throughout the world who wants truth, who wants to know what happened here. And to those people, the city of David firmly explains that our people suffered this destruction 2,000 years ago. We lived here with two incredible dynasties beforehand, and the dream of that dynasty and the feeling of that dynasty never ever left our souls until we came back to this land. And everything you pull out of the ground in the city of David, every stone you overturn is another element of that, which is why here we are next to the Temple Mount. Ikrim Asabri, the Mufti of the Temple Mount, once said in a Friday sermon, or many times said, any stone you turn over in Jerusalem, not one of them shows Jewish history. He has to say this, Yishai, because every little child that kicks a bit of sand here uncovers 3,000 years of our people's history here. That's the power of where we are. Nobody can erase us. These stones may have fallen, but we're back here today. They can say that this place is called Palestine, but we know and everything we uncover is Israel. It was, it is, and it always will be. The Hadrianic War continues and we are determined to win it. We are determined to know our own history, to know our truth, and therefore to know our rights. And I guess in the end, we're fighting the same battle, which is Lecherut Zion for the liberation of Zion. Daron Spielman, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, Yishai